everyone and welcome to local television. We are here tonight in the Angler's Rest in Caragadrahad and we have a host of talent lined up for you. Plenty of musicians, singers and dancers and I think a storyteller. Perhaps there's a few interesting people here as well for us to meet. And now we will lead off with the Hina Coltus group and they will give us a selection of jigs. Thank you very much. I know I think we will have a song and none other than Peggy Lynch. What are you going to sing for tonight, Peg? A song about Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> 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 Some English politicians now want Ireland to be one And Maggie Thatcher's telling us just how it should be done She's got a plan to reunite the orange and the green She'll scrap the Irish border if we recognize the Queen Now the Queen to every Englishman is very, very dear which isn't too surprising at a million pounds a year. And I suspect that Thatcher is making all this fuss because she wants to sack the Queen and palm her off on us. Now if the Queen comes to us, she'll have to understand that we'll be first-class subjects then Oh, nothing second hand. She cannot rule from London, long distance, so to speak. She'll have to live in Dublin on 20 pounds a week. And she'll have to get a proper job, like opening every doll. I'm going to
to huddling matches and throwing in the ball. When she'll address the nation on St. Patrick's Day or that, she'll have to speak in Gaelic and wear shamrock in her hat. And she'll get a corporation house, but she'll find that very hard. And there'll be no ceremonial at the changing of the guard. At six o'clock each evening, Guard Hagerty will come, riding on his bicycle to let Muldoon go home. <coughs> and on the royal birthday, sure there'll be no parade. Herself and Ian Paisley will have buns and lemonade. And when she drives through Dublin, there won't be any fuss. You'd hardly recognize her when she's sitting in a bus. Now if the Queen comes to us, we'll then have to arrange which of our noted leaders we will offer in exchange. Now of all the politicians and notables we've got, which one is indispensable? Sure, we'll offer her the lot. No, it's just a little fancy. Sure, the Thatcher plan is daft. Back into the empire, how the Irish must have laughed. Recognize the queen, she said. She was talking through her hat. For as daft as some of our lads are, they're not as daft as that. Thank you. Well, here beside me now is a gentleman with a violin, none better than Dermot O'Donovan. Dermot, how did you start playing, really? When I started when I was about 14 years, and uh, I found a fiddle uh, up in the attic at home. And, uh, I was in bits, of course, after 100 years maybe. So I built it up and I started away from there. And I stopped at it for about five or six years, I suppose. And I gave it up completely. And I came back to it again when I was my, into my 70s. And uh, I'm playing away since. <laughs> Nothing like it. And over tonight you're going to play for a slow air, is it? Just leaving them on. Leave them on. Well done, Dermot.
Thank you very much. Now we're going to change the program to a bit of dancing, and we're going to have Neely Coakley and Peggy Lynch doing the Highland Fling. Well, down here beside me is a woman known as Johnny Shea, whom is known very well, I think, in this district. Johnny, you were a part-time postman. Yes. And do you find the work interesting? Yes, very interesting. Only for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, do you get a bad fight from the dogs? Sometimes. They're not too bad. Did any dog bite you? Yes, they did. In other words, they have caught you by the leg? Yes. <laughs> they have, yes. And do you get many cups of tea on your own in the morning? No, eh? I don't take it. You don't take it? No, and you're fine and slim. <laughs> and how do you manage? Do you get letters now, say, if you had two people in the one with the one address? How would you manage them? Like how, you go, how could you distinguish back. one from you the other? Can. You don't distinguish them, you send them back. You send them Get back. Them re readdressed properly. And re addressed, I understand. I know for your position, do you have to learn any foreign languages, like? No, no a bit of Irish, you know, if you know a bit of Irish. Yeah, but how Irish. would you manage now if you got a German letter, or an Italian letter, or a French letter? Like, how would you, how would you follow the readings? if you haven't got a foreign language. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, if you that there, you would know who they would be. Like we have a lot of uh, foreigners in the area. Yes, you would know. <laughs> I can read German. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, you find it a very interesting job. Yes, I do. <laughs> would, you rec would you recommend it for school leavers? And why not? Because I should be a certain age. Yeah. No driving license. Oh, well, I mean, our oh, children do have to do their leaving cert. Yes. You think it would be that there would be a, a bright future in it for them? There would, yeah. <laughs> okay, Johnny. Thank you very much. Now we have a group of musicians from Coachford and they're going to give us a selection of reels. Sorry, they say jigs. Thank you. 
Now we'll have a change in program again. We'll have a song from Anya Marie Shea. One day as I went on my rambles From Swinfar to sweet Balilee I met a fair maid on my rambles And her name it was Mary she sighed for the rights of her country. Michael Dabbert, her true Irish boy, who is now in a prison in Portland, far from the lovely sweet banks of the Moy. I quickly approached this fair maiden, asked her what was the cause of her woe, and what was the cause of her misery, which forced her to leave her own home. She said for the rights of my country, Michael Duffett, my true Irish boy, is now in a prison in Portland, far from the lovely sweet banks of the mine. Don't talk of that sweet 67, we had brave men and true men, you know. There was young Peter Carney, God bless him, who died in Killarney also. He was drilled by my darling Mick David in the valleys and plains of Fermoy. That is why he is a prisoner in Portland. Far from the lovely sweet banks of the mine. So now to conclude and to finish, I hope that the day will soon come when those cruel landlords and bailiffs from the Isle of St. Patrick must run. We will unfold our green and gold banner and we'll wave it for Ireland on high and 
And we'll toast to that brave Michael Davitt from the lovely sweet banks of the Moy. We have a group of visiting musicians here now. Mickey Holland, the accordion, Andrew Connell on the banjo, and Jackie Donovan on the violin, and they will give us a selection of jigs. I know we're going to have a song from a local man, none better than Derry Dunley. <coughs> the chimes of time rang out anew, another day is true. Someone slipped and fell, was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, cause I have news for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. There is no night, for in his light, 
you'll never walk alone. You'll always feel at home, no matter where you roam. There is no power can conquer you when God is on your side. Take him at his promise, don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Now we're going to have a solo dance from Anne-Marie O'Shea and she'll be accompanied by Tim Joe O'Reardon. Anya is going to dance a hornpipe. Thank you very much. I know we're going to have Mick Finnegan for a song. It was at a campfire concert on a lonely western trail. The singers came from lands beyond the sea. One sang of Bonnie Scotland, of Loch Lomond, Bonnie Bray. Another sang an English melody. It was then an Irish lad stood up. I like your song, said he, your country's too are a beautiful and fair, but I'll sing you a song of Ireland, where the three leaves shamrock grow. There is no place like old Ireland anywhere, for it's only a step from Killarney to heaven, the beautiful land of my birth. When my thoughts wander by to the dear isle of Shamrock, it's Killarney for you and for me. 
its valleys and fell, its deep winding dell, lead a pathway to paradise. Sure is there, I was born on a bright harvest morn, and is there. I am longing to die. No, we have a very young dancer here, and she's Anya Dun Lee, and she's going to dance for us a light jig. Here beside me, we have a young lady, none other than Helen Helensey. Helen is from the very talented family of Canavy, and it, all that family, I think, her brothers and sisters are very, very talented. Helen, you think, is in Limerick training to be a teacher. How do you find the work there? Well, the work this year is getting um, quite difficult. First year was hard settling, and second year was we were easing our way into it then, but this year is going is tough enough. But come next June, we'll be out. Please God. Well, that's good. You play some musical instruments as well, I understand. Yes, um, I play the piano and the organ. My sisters, they play, some play accordions and tin whistles. And my brother plays the accordion and an organ as well. Very good. But you prefer traditional singing? Or some kind of singing anyway? Well, yes, I think I have a feeling, and most of the family have a feeling for the traditional music culture of Ireland. So. What are you going to give us tonight, Helen? Well, this is a song that I taught actually last September to the children up in Canterbury. It's a traditional song. It's, the name of it is The Plough Boy. Right, away so. with you and the best of luck to you. Thank you. <coughs> there was a young lady in the old country And friends she had many of every degree she rode in great riches and was free from all care till her father's young plough boy her heart did ensnare one day as she wandered her father's domain Young Willie, the plough boy, was ploughing the plain. He there looked so gallant as he sang a sweet song, for to cheer up his horses as they ploughed along. She called on her ploughboy to stop for a while, and as he looked around him with a nod and a smile, her cheeks blushed like roses as this he did say. You've been deep in my thoughts, love, alone as I 
stray. You give over your plowing, and that very soon we'll go to America in the gay month of June. We'll go to America like thousands to go, and I'll be proud of my plowboy wherever I go. Thank you. Now we're going to have a change in the program again. We're going to have a forehand reel. Oh, yeah. 
this public house that I knew and uh, you would hardly ever see anyone going in or out of it. Yeah, it was run by three sisters, all fairly ancient. I'd say now uh, they were behind the door when good looks were being given out. And uh, one of the sisters would be always uh, standing at the front door, her two hands under her apron and she daidling. Maria, you know that it was a gay house. Well, at the time uh, that the roads and the bridges was cut, there was an awful scarcity of, of drink. And Ned Connors, he had an awful mind for porter. As the man said, he'd drink it out of a hostel's cropper for you. And he went into this public house that ain't talking about. Well, uh, the sister that was at the door, uh, daedling the blackbird, she backed in before him. So Ned called for a pint. And after a lot of time scanning, she put the pint up on the counter. And you could see the Sulians winking on top of it. Well, it nearly failed him get it down. And finally, anyway, when he had it finished, he made a move to go on. Arrow off the sheet. I, I am so see. I suppose so see, only for the scarcity of drink, he said you wouldn't come into me at all. Well, I'll tell you one thing, says Ned. You'll have a lot of daedling done before I'll come into you again. Your Ned was noted. He took every pledge that was ever yet known, even the anti-treating pledge, uh, that was brought in, you see, again, standing around. Of course, standing around is all right uh, while, there's, uh, while the company is small, but when there's seven or eight in the batch, it is a house of a different colour. And maybe when the man that opened the proceedings, they start the off on the second leg of the course, well, there's rough weather ahead. 
Well, did anyway, finally anyway, the mother, the wife's mother came to live with him and she wasn't long putting a stop to his ways. So she marched him up to, to the convent to Sister Benedict and made him go on his two knees and take the pledge. And for a great wonder, he kept it. So after a while, then they had pity for him and they relented a little bit. So they allowed him one drink a day. Well, Ned made a habit of taking this drink at closing time or a little bit after it. And there's a bit of a history attached to that too, and sure I might as well tell it while I'm at it. Ned had a big white tomcat that you follow him everywhere he go. Even uh, when he'd be going up the stairs at night to bed, he'd have a little boxing match with the cat out between the, the rungs of the stairs. And when you go across the road to the public house, the cat used to follow him. And the cat then would sit up on the windowsill and uh, everyone outside then, uh, passing along, seeing the cat, would know that Ned was inside having his daily pint. And uh, his temperance, of course, brought him uh, a bit of prosperity and uh, he had a big roomy house and the wife encouraged with a bit of money she turned it into a kind of an eating house, he used to keep lodgers. Uh, two young girls used to stay there, you know, the force was only in its infancy at the time. And they were long coming to the house and they became to know Ned and they knew the cat. And they knew Ned's habit of going across the road to the pub every night. And of course they'd never read the pub while the cat was sitting on the windowsill. Oh, raiding pubs like was a regular occurrence that time because the licensing laws were not as liberal as they are now. <laughs> well, I remember this way every night, I was inside there myself, and there was a great crowd around. There was something on in the village too, and I think the same day, in the same greatly mistake, no, I think it was a bull inspection. And there was a good crowd inside anyway, and the talk was quite fine and leisurely. And the publican was in no hurry out with him, now that Ned was inside and the cat outside in the windowsill. He knew that he was safe anywhere for the length of time it took Ned to down his pint. Well, Ned was no more than about halfway down the pint when this knock came at the door. Guards and duty open up. Cream deal, says Ned, there must be new guards, he said, because old lads would have noticed the cat. Clear, so the publican out the back. Frightened of an endorsement. Well, there was a general stampede for the back door, and next minute all lights were out, total eclipse. And uh, the first of them were no sooner out than they were doubling back in again. Uh, like rabbits, now you say that it'd be the ferret in the turn of a borough. <laughs> Wasn't there another guard at the back eight? Well, our plan was then, if our geography was right, to go up the stairs and out a window in the back and get onto a galvanized roof and make a good old escape down into a neighbor's yard. But there's one thing I'm going to tell you that a galvanized roof at night time can be very slippery. Well, the first fella out, the two legs were taken from under him and he went sailing down the roof and fell ten feet below on the top of God knows only what. Well, I could not repeat here what he said. And he had himself no sooner straightened and another fellow came tearing down on top of him. Well, there was this big corporation of a man there. Someone told me after that he was home from Ohio on holidays. And we were all hanging out him trying to keep him standing. Well, blessed out tonight if he didn't lose his balance. And he came down with such a report. Hens, ducks, pigs, geese, all the animals in the vicinity woke up as we went sailing down the roof and fell ten feet below into the dark hall of Calcutta. <laughs> oh, the new her language. I tell you, drink lubricates the talking machine. It was like Dunkirk. And so where did we fall? Only down into the publican's yard where the guards were. So our names were taken and we had all our work cut out for nothing. And when Ned came out in the street, he made straight for the windowsill. But there was no trace of the cat. And whatever look he gave there below up in the school wall was Ned, Ned Connor's white tom cat 
and he holding a loud conversation with another member of his own community. <laughs> and uh, she seemed to be saying to him, Ah, no! <coughs> Not no! <laughs> well, that says to you anyway, Panger Bonsel, Ned. You may be sure he said I wouldn't be caught in sight here to mighty faith as you had a date. Thank you. <laughs> Now we're going to have Mickey Holohan, Andrew Connell, and Dick Daly give us a selection of reels. Well, now I think time has come for us to go and bid you all farewell from the Angler's Rest here in Carrigadrahud. We would like to thank Jerry O'Callaghan for giving us use of his premises. I think it's a good place to get a good pint and a very friendly bar staff. I know, Jerry, you might like to say a few words. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome each and everybody here tonight. I'd like to thank everybody that organized this tonight and it shows how much untapped talent is in the country with a, that, uh, that could be very well used in, in various places. I haven't very much to say to you, only to thank you, but I have just one yarn to tell you in here just before I go. There was this young lad here in England anyway, he wasn't too satisfied with conditions at home. He thought he, he went out for a softer life. So he joined the army over and after about a fact that he wrote home to his father saying that uh, he wanted to go home. So the father wrote back to him saying, stick it for another 12 months, he said, until make a man of you. He the young fellow came home after the 12 months and yeah, but the father died. And the priest asked him to see how he pray for his father. So I don't know, is it much good, he said, because he said if he's in heaven, he said, there's no use in praying for him, he's all right. And if he's in hell, he said, it's no good. And if, if he's in purgatory, he said, 12 months and make a man of him. <laughs> <laughs> So I have no more to say, only Gurmir Mahagot, Agus Kanairi, the Boholat. Thanks very much indeed. We'll have the grand finale with all the musicians that have played here tonight. We're going to have a final session. Thank you.